But um, I ended up just going and changing to take the 56 plus like I used to. It just didn't really improve my my timing. Now Talon actually made it worse. So. Why? What? What do you guys? What do you perceive to be? So what's slowing it down? So they took the steps the, are farther apart for yeah. one thing. So a lot of people spend more time watching to a stop. Uh huh. They just put a, light, a lot of light priorities in, but I think a lot of those got done. The one at 35th and Avalon generally broke, so I think they turned it off. Is that correct? I live up at this end. I live at Old Just I live off 37th and, and just off where the park is, you know, in the overlook. And so I was about a block and a half from the bus stop at 56 that I've been taking the town back and forth. We did that quite a bit. At this point, I have to walk a half a mile to the junction, and now to, and I used to be able to be downtown within 20 or 30 minutes, depending on how it was expressed. But but my point is that I now have to walk a half a mile and catch the bus going in the opposite direction down to the other junction to catch the rapid ride downtown. My alternative is to drive down to the bottom of the hill by the still mill and try to park, but I'm not a commuter. So by 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, when I'm looking for rides, no parking. There's no parking. Okay. The and the last stop going across, I mean, the 56 used to stop under the bridge so people could park under the bridge. There's no rapid ride stop under the bridge, so that parking lot is now empty. Yes. What parking lot is that? Who wants it's that? just up underneath, right underneath the west side of the bridge. You know what they're talking about? Yeah. So, it's a parking lot. So I'm interested. I've heard pr the preliminary numbers, I, uh, what I seem to remember hearing, and, and so now I want to follow up and get numbers, is that, that they are seeing more ridership overall, even you know when they look at the overall ridership from here. Um, the other, so I, I'm, I want to go back and get a report on that. Now that's Metro, of course, makes the service decisions. We make the uh, decisions on the right of way. Right? We own the right of way. So we make the decisions about parking, uh, lane priority, signal priority and the like and, and we've been trying to give them more priority you may remember with the luna cafe there was a lot of back and forth right there were you know a business that had parking issues had some concerns too so i don't know i'm glad I to hear that, from you about this that is working the, the buses are faster when you're on them there's more frequency at night i mean when you get on and the, when you get on oh, the lane priority helps about night. Yeah. I mean, I live down at the end of the, what used to be the end of the 55 line, it's now the 128. I am mobily challenged, so I need to ride the bus. And at night, we used to go down to the art museum for events pretty frequently, the pair of us. Right. We now drive because the interchange at night is, I have to stand down in Alaska for half hour, 40 minutes, whatever, until the 128 comes, I catch a rapid ride. Sorry, I have to transfer there. There is no coordination between between that. So it, during the day, I will catch the 128 down to the Alaska Junction and, and then catch the bus downtown for appointments, whatever I have to do. But it's not as fast a ride. I have more walking, uh, yeah. considerably more. Walking down on an inclement day down to Admiral is, is, yes, it's only seven blocks, but when you're almost 80, seven blocks becomes much more of a challenge than it used to be. Uh, you know, we're, so. We're, we're that's seeing a like problem. light rail going to what, Capitol Hill and some other places. Right along. Sorry about that. Do we ever see that being possibility in the West Seattle? So, um, the timelines on this, on all, on, the timelines on rail are long. Sure. A streetcar is faster than light rail. Rapid rides should be faster than either of those. Um, so, to give you an idea, the first hill streetcar was approved when Sound Transit was approved, and it will be constructed, you know, 2014. So it's about, that's about as fast as you can go from approval of something to construction, five years. Um, so we are uh, doing joint planning with Sound Transit on an alternatives analysis from downtown to Ballard. So that one is more accelerated. But, so after alternatives analysis, the next problem there is funding, right? And then we have to do the EIS. So there's no funding to build that, just to be clear. And whether that is Sound Transit 3, um, or some city level of funding um, is dependent on a bunch of other factors. Sound Transit, as a result, the reason I'm mentioning that is as a result of us pushing Sound Transit to accelerate its planning along that line, 
the response from the rest of the region at first was, we're worried about Seattle going ahead. We don't want Seattle to build what they need and leave the rest of the region without its life, without completing its stuff. But we said, no, 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 look, if we're going to, you know, the way Sound Transit works is every region gets a piece of the pie when we bake a new pie, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody gets something out of a new ballot measure. So we just want to start planning our piece now. And as a result, the rest of the Sound Transit region said, well, let's start planning everything faster. So they've actually pushed the Sound Transit Board to accelerate mm -hmm. the planning for all of the extensions, the potential extensions that would go into Sound Transit 3. And, and to do so on a pace that there would be a potential for a 2016 ballot measure on Sound Transit 3. Now, to do a 2016 ballot measure isn't just a question of getting the planning done. Sound Transit would also need additional revenue authority to build anything. Right now, Sound Transit's existing revenue authority is uh, kind of fully accounted for until 2024 to both build what they promised to build and operate what they will build. So they, before they have new revenue available from their existing revenue authority is until 2024, and that would be to build that would be for a Sound Transit 3 that would be one-fifth the size of Sound Transit 2. So current course and speed, Sound Transit 3 is a long way away, and it's small. So this is a big deal for the legislature, for the governor, for the region. Will we push to get light rail on the ballot by 2016 so we can expand? One of the corridors under analysis, so all of the, so in order to go develop a Sound Transit 3 package, they have to do We'll, we'll do something called corridor analysis to decide what are the corridors which will be a priority for Sound Transit 3. One of the corridors is downtown to West Seattle. Um, there'll be also, but there are a host of other corridors in that study. So that's the current status mm -hmm. of Link Light Rail mm -hmm. to West Seattle. In, in terms of our transit master plan and looking at what we could do, uh, it, it wasn't identified as one of the five highest priority corridors to get to West Seattle. Um, it, it, it was one of the 20 priority quarters, but not the top five. So um, that, that's where we are right now. I just want to kind of clear with everybody. And that was based on how, where's the greatest demand. So what were identified as the top five were up Madison to Capitol Hill, you know, the current bus service, Capitol Hill, downtown, very dense, connecting, getting through downtown, you know, connecting the streetcar, getting to Lower Queen Anne, getting to Ballard, were, and getting South Lake Union to U District were identified as the top five. Um, and then after that, we have 15 other corridors which were identified as uh, places where we need to improve, and this is one of those corridors. I don't see how light rail addresses any problem anybody's mentioned so far, because mm -hmm. light rail stops are even farther apart than, and that's than the yeah. uh, C line and D line stops. They, no. In North yeah, Seattle, there's like about three mass stops, transit, yeah. and it, so you wind yeah. up having even more transfers and more walking. Yeah, and he asked me about mass transit, so I wanted to answer yeah. the light rail yeah. question. The question of metro, which probably be the next thing, the question <coughs> of metro funding, you know, the number, the so uh, the question of stops is one issue. The other question is frequency. How often can you have buses? Frequency can be addressed through priority in the right of way, which we talked about a little bit. Uh, the other issue is just the number of buses that are available. Right now, Metro is looking at a 17% service cut um, if this legislature doesn't approve new revenue authority for Metro. So I've been working with Dow Constantine. We've got 47 uh, mayors around the state. I've worked with Skip Priest, who's a Republican of, in SeaTac, federal way. Um, to, uh, we, we jointly reached out to mayors around the state to build a coalition around additional authority. So in the legislature right now is a local options bill. And that local options would give counties the authority to collect more money, and a portion of that would go to cities. And we really want that local options to pass, not just to rescue Metro, but so that we have money for uh, you know, maintenance, potholes, signals, mm -hmm. transit priority, all of those things, because our budget's been really squeezed, um, you know, over time. So we hope we get that additional authority, and then Metro will be in a position to potentially expand and improve. We'll be in a position to make more right-of-way improvements as well as take care of what we have better um, than right now. So 
that's a big push is the local the local options bill. And the comment you made about light rail, one of the things that really came through in our transit master plan study was, and you just said it, and we didn't pay you much money to be a consultant. Um, but what we learned was we're doing a better job of connecting regional urban centers to each other, mm -hmm. but we're not doing a very good job of connecting neighborhoods to each other in Seattle. It just we're not. And part of the reason is, you know, you got the state, and the state cares about, tends to care about the state highway system. Um, and, you know, they have a responsibility for the whole state, but that's, they own that, so to speak. And then you have the regional authority, and they tend to really care about connecting regional urban centers to each other. You know, and that's why Ballard rates higher, because it's, they're, they're big, and West Seattle's getting bigger. I mean, it's, it's becoming more of a regional center. And it then comes down to for, the responsibility for really pushing to connect neighborhoods to each other is really on us and the county. And we just don't have the funding authority to do it. And so that's why we did a transit master planning part, was mm -hmm. to identify what our priorities were, do the planning, so that we can compete for federal funding, so that we can influence sound transit when they go to Sound Transit 3, and so that we can look at what do we want to invest in ourselves. Um, and so that's why having an identification of our priority corridors and, and, what, and then look at what we want to do in each one is so important. Um, so we're doing the planning, but the next step is the implement, planning you know, costs this much, the implementation costs this much. So that's what we need to get more money for. Mayor, I have a question, just kind sure. of the reason I think why we wanted you to come here to this location where this intersection is, is to have you experience firsthand yes. what it is to walk through that intersection um, and for, you know, and you walked with a large group. Um, many of the neighborhood children, elderly folks um, walk individually through that intersection or as a pair um, and it continues to be a threat. Um, go up five blocks to the light. Are they? Yeah, go up five blocks. So, um, you know, different alternatives to crossing here have been always discussed since the um, since Tatsuo Nakata was struck in 2006 in November. Um, but the fact of the matter remains that this is a this is a key intersection yes. for pedestrians. Um, I guess my question gets to: We started this process in earnest, following and truly in earnest, following the death of Mr. Nakata. And previously, too, and previously really. too, Don was very involved in yeah. Carl as well um, in, in getting enhanced safety measures here. Um, and we were able to get some through SDOT, but ultimately kept finding that there, you know, the threats continue to pedestrian safety. I mean, very real threats, you know, people's so, lives are at risk. And, and so we pursued this through SDOT. They didn't, they've come out, they've done their studies, We've asked, okay, you know, our, and they told us that we qualify. This is a very eligible intersection for a pedestrian signal, so a pedestrian activated stop light that would hang over the intersection or a series of them. They have told us that we would qualify for that. Then they put us on a list, which we were not even privy to until we um, got information from Tom Rasmussen, city council member, that we were then 11th on the list, and then we were bumped down to 13th on the list in terms of priority. We were informed that only two such signals, a maximum, are awarded per year. Then they came back to us and said, well, it looks like it's really going to be a long wait for you. It's too bad. Maybe you should apply for fund for grant money. When before we had been told that we shouldn't apply for grant money because we couldn't do that as a neighborhood. So now, We've applied, and um, I kind of led the charge um, for this bridging the bridging the gap neighborhood street fund grant through SDOT. It's SDOT money. Why are neighborhoods applying for grants when from the same agency that they can't they couldn't get the money from in the first place? I don't know if I'm saying that clearly, but <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. And I feel like we've for the past six years plus we've been spinning our wheels. In this process, this is a very real threat. It has killed a man, and it is—it's going to kill another person. And injured, injured, injured many. several. Yeah. Um, so I'm—I—I'm I'm not going to apologize for raising my voice because I feel no. very strongly about it. And it was throughout my administration as president of the neighborhood association. It was one of my um, key things that that I always was pushing for. Uh, I know it's very dear to Don's heart and to Carl's as and to many admiral neighbors. 
it's just, it's, um, it's a sad statement about uh, our community and our, our relationship with city government, uh, why this has not been addressed. So. so this is why I do neighborhood walks, is because I want to hear from people directly and see things myself. And so I, I thank you for taking me out here. Thank you for speaking up. I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, so I live in, uh, I, I mentioned before, I live in Greenwood, mm -hmm. and uh, and so, and, and I, I live about two blocks north of 85th, we, we call it I-85, um, <laughs> you know, through Greenwood, uh, and, you know, just a few blocks from me, uh, a 16-year-old boy, you know, car stopped in the curb lane, and a uh, 16-year-old boy went to go across to catch a bus on the other side of the street and the car following didn't know why a car was stopped in the curb lane and, and swerved out and, and hit him and he's you know severely uh, he has permanent disability yeah. as a result um, over on 15th in my neighborhood is uh, um, a young a young was a I think it was a 10 year old boy Nick um, same thing happened in this case it was a the car in the curb lane stopped, and the, and the car in the, in the center lane discontinued on him. It was a truck, a pickup truck, and the mirror hit him in the head, and he's permanently brain damaged as well. So it's, you know, it's one of the, um, we, we want to reduce, you know, road and traffic deaths down. And I, uh, you know, I've seen, I'm here, I hear you, I've seen it, and, uh, you know, the question you asked about the, the, the neighborhood street fund versus the regular funding, I think part of the reason for that is to provide an outlet for people to, you know, receive funding through, you know, not, you know, for neighborhoods to prioritize what's most important. But I will go back personally and, and take a look at where the prioritization is and what the options are. I don't like to stand here, I don't like to go into a neighborhood and say, I will do X. I always have to, I feel it's my responsibility to go back to the department, talk to them, hear their, hear their side of the story. Mm -hmm. But let me go do that. What, yeah. Okay. One final thought that I'd like to add about Admiral Way in particular is that back in its in its heyday, Admiral Way was a trolley line. Yeah. So that's, it was constructed as that. It was never constructed yeah. as a automobile roadway. And so it's beautiful. It's this wonderful winding sort of way down yeah. to the beach. But as a result of kind of accommodating from a trolley line to cars, that's some of the particular specific challenges of Admiral Way versus some of the other streets. It's very clear that so, the cars are yeah. that the street design invites a high rate of speed, right. which is very which, which we is, love to reduce, which yeah. creates issues. Right, and it's a street design. What we know is. Um, you know, so for example, there's been, uh, you know, I've gotten uh, some grief for the rechannelization projects where you get rid of the two lanes each way for the mm -hmm. center turn lane and the bike lanes. Um, just so you know, most, the, the, the biggest reason to do that is actually not the bike lane. It's actually to make it safe to cross. What that tends to do is bring down the speeds. Now you already have that, but there's other yeah. environmental reasons why it moves faster. But, but that's one of the reasons we do it. And what we find is that uh, it, dramat it reduces speeds and it provides for safe crossings. Uh, but even there, there's the, you know, we, we do, there are other streets we don't do it on because the issues of traffic volumes take higher priority than the issues of pedestrian crossings. And this is one of the really big issues, you know, that we face as a city. And, and people do get upset about it on both sides, you know, um, is, uh, you know, as we transition to places that have lots more people living in them, lots more people on foot, more people choosing to ride bicycles, whether for whether by choice, whether because of expense, you know, or whether by necessity, uh, we have to really rethink our street system. And if you're bringing down, and we are going to be bringing down. The result is we're going to be bringing down speeds, and we're going to have to rebalance our roadways to give priority to other users, and that means that some people's drive is going to be longer. And that's a challenge for people, I'm just saying. It's going to be a challenge for people, but it means that neighborhoods will be better places, too. And that's the trade-off. Interesting in that the speed down from the steel mill 
is posted and enforced at 30 miles an hour. I think there is a sign, I've looked for it a couple times, sometimes I miss it, that says 30 miles on this, but it's way down the hill. I'll tell you, enforcement. And it's yeah. like, like everybody thinks this is 35. I don't know what it is. Uh, but, you know. If, if I may, Mayor, we, after the incident, uh, we heard about the three E's, right? engineering, education, and enforcement. Mm -hmm. And so we have the education and enforcement attribute when sales police responded, put out the van uh, yeah. of indicating the speed, and they did the, uh, a little presence here, so did some warning, and the captain came out. Um, so that got in the neighborhood conscience for a little bit, but that's been evaporated. Um, the engineering, we have the bull bouts or the traffic right. calming. Um, uh, we, we've had refreshment of, of the signage. Uh, yep. and, and we're just, we, we just need to get over the hump. We've been talking with, uh, as you know, we talked with you three years ago as we came as a Yeah, and I remember group. that, and I said we're going to take another look at it, but right. I think some changes were made after that. Radar speed signs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I, I hear you. I, I'm not trying to be confrontational. I just no. want to get, get more information out there about those three E's. And um, as you know uh, about my cups of coffee out here on the sidewalk, um, then candidate um, Mike uh, O'Brien was out here, and he actually got out in the intersection and started looking at the line of sights from the cyclist viewpoint, from, yeah. from his um, uh, viewpoint. And other candidates were saying, where's the, where's the memorial to Tatsu? And I think that's a very valid point. Yeah. And uh, other suggestions were, maybe we need those public um, service announcements from our electeds, from, uh, from other folks, to say, Seattle, calm down. You know, uh, There's the very dramatic one in San Francisco where the person is driving, there's a bump, and they, and they drop their latte. It says, you saved your latte, but you just killed grandma. So very, very strong message. I'm not suggesting that's what we need to do, but maybe we need to work more on that education as, as uh, public policy makers that this is a cultural change. So we, we have, um, I'm going to make a couple of quick comments. Yeah, thank and, you. And then Sol keeps pointing to his uh, yeah. watch. <laughs> so a couple of quick comments. We have launched an education campaign, Be Super Safe, and, and we'd ask you to participate in it. But I want to be really clear, you know, with a couple of things you're saying, enforcement and education, um, only take you so far, and that's what you're saying. Exactly. I hear that's what you're saying. Yes. I hear that's what all of you are saying. I mean, Nickerson and 125th were mm -hmm. two streets where we did rechannelizations. And what I heard from our motorcycle officers who hand out our traffic enforcement division, whenever they wanted to make sure they were collecting enough tickets to show they were working, they would just head down 125th yeah. and Nickerson. <laughs> they could hand out as many tickets as they wanted. It wasn't. Well, we had that change. here on Admiral. Exactly. They, and I'm sure they can come here, too. You can enforce and enforce and enforce. When a road design says go fast, the enforcement alone won't change it, nor will the education alone change it. So I hear you loud and clear on that point. And uh, we are working on education, and it can make a difference. The biggest thing we need for people to do is to put down, this is what we know, leading cause of uh, uh, is uh, impaired. First one is impaired, so uh, drinking or other impairment. The second leading cause of accidents is distraction, and it's cell phones and texting, et cetera. Those are the, those are the top two. <coughs> Yeah, talking, texting, but whatever, distracted mm -hmm. driving is the second largest cause. Um, so, you know, we'll educate on those, we'll work on those, but in some places it is ultimately engineering is the only one that's really going to get it. So I heard everybody, and we'll go, you know, I, I have to run, I really apologize. I'd love to sit here and chat with you all day, but there's another group waiting for me. Can I just ask you a funding suggestion because I'm a yeah. fairly new writer of the, the redone yeah. station uh, situation yeah. with the buses. There's these big guys, rider enforcement, you know, they go around and check to see. And I think it's a waste of time. It just really alienates people. I've seen them insult. And they're not trying to do that. Take the money you're spending on rider enforcement and put it towards something else. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, thank you for taking me for the walk around the neighborhood. Thank you all for coming out. And thank you all for how much you care for your neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.